Friends from my side, a very warm welcome as well. It's always good to gather together as the people of God to experience God's love through those around us. Our call to worship will come up uh, on the screen and I invite you to read with me the words that are involved as I lead us through the rest. So come, listen. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We come and we wait in the just peace of the coming Messiah. Pay attention. God is removing barriers and leveling the playing field, making a way for all people to witness the glory of the Lord. We pay attention and we wait in the just peace of the coming Messiah. We wait and we work as God landscapes, filling in as God's landscapers, filling in valleys and making rough places of pain, bringing justice where conflicts and obstacles once reigned. We wait and we work in the just peace of the Holy Messiah. As we gather, may we prepare our voices to proclaim and our hands to get messy as our lives declare the coming of our Saviour and Comforter. We come to worship and grow in the just peace of Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. Amen. And let's pray. <coughs> Gracious and loving God, in our worship we seek to be ready to meet with you. We prepare ourselves. We still ourselves. We organise ourselves. We get ourselves into the right frame of mind. And now we come to you in prayer. We come with thanksgiving for the beauty of this day, for the wonder of life, for the fellowship of this place, for the freedom to meet and worship, and for the gospel message of this Advent season. So we rejoice with the universal church as we journey through Advent in worship and in faith. Make us ready for the coming of our Lord. But are we ready yet? Are we really prepared to meet you here? Are we properly ready for the wonder of the Incarnation? We look at how we are and who we are, and we wonder how we'll look to you. We still wear our garments of sorrow and affliction, for life may have been tough for us, and the burdens we carry might be hard to bear. We're still dressed in the garments of failures, promises made and promises broken, acts of kindness missed and acts of sinfulness offered. We're still clothed in unrighteousness and we're ashamed. We're still dressed in the garments of doubt and uncertainty. We're not perfect and we have so many questions. But mostly we hide them under our coats of respectability, our jackets of strength, while underneath we're shabby and grey. Are we ready? Are we prepared to look on such as for, uh, are we prepared for you to look on such as us? But just when we want to turn away in our shame, your message comes to us again. Put on the beauty of the glory from God, for you deserve love, my dear children. Put on the robe of righteousness, and don't be fearful of my wrath, for this is the message that comes from God. Put on your head the diadem of the glory of the everlasting, for you need no longer be ashamed. Ready? Yes, we can be ready, not through our own purposes, but by offering ourselves to you, Lord God. Not through our own efforts, but by believing that our God will show your splendour everywhere under heaven, even for the likes of each one of us. So now we can be prepared. Now we know you can look at us and smile. Now we can recognise again that you and your people are one. We pray this all in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. 
Friends, we turn now to our scripture reading or readings for this morning. And the first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 1 to 11. Comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them they have suffered long enough and their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them in full for all their sins. A voice cries out, Prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our God. Fill every valley. Level every mountain. The hills will become a plain, and the rough country will be made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it. The Lord himself has promised this. A voice cries out, Proclaim a message. What message shall I proclaim, I ask? Proclaim that all people are like grass. They last no longer than wild flowers. Grass withers and flowers fade when the Lord sends the wind blowing over them. People are no more enduring than grass. Yes, yes, grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Jerusalem, go up on a high mountain and proclaim the good news. Call out with a loud voice, Simon, announce the good news. Speak out and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah that their God is coming. The sovereign Lord is coming to rule with power, bringing with him the people he has rescued. He will take care of his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. Thanks be to God for this word. And then our second reading is taken from 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 8 to the first part of 15. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him the two are the same. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. But... The day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God, as you wait for the day of God. And... Do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed, and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised. New heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. And so, my dear friends, as you wait for that day, do your best to be pure and faultless in God's sight, and be at peace with Him. Look on our Lord's patience as the opportunity He has given you to be saved. Thanks be to God for this word to us. Advent is a time when we focus on the coming of God. Isaiah speaks of a, of a time when in verse, uh, in verse 10, the Sovereign Lord is coming to rule with power, bringing with him the people he has rescued. He will take care of the flock like a shepherd, and he will, carry, he will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. And then about 500 years after these words are written, when the people of God are living under the oppression of the Roman Empire, a baby is born. 
and he is named Jesus, which means God is our salvation, or God saves. And he's referred to as the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who brings God's salvation. And he's also called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus' cousin, John, starts preaching in the wilderness, and he uses the words from Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way for the, uh, in the desert for our God. Fill every valley. Level every mountain. The hills will become a plain and the rough country will be made smooth. And, and with that message, John says, repent. Turn your lives around. The word repent in the New Testament and in the original Greek which it was written literally means change your, your thinking, your way of thinking, your way of seeing the world. Turn your lives around, turn your thinking around and be baptized. In other words, clean up your acts because God's reign as promised has drawn near. And John points to Jesus as the fulfillment of that promise. And Jesus changes everything. Everything that Jesus does demonstrates God's perfect reign as promised. The new creation that we hear about begins in Christ. But he promises that he will return to complete the restoration of all things. That he has begun in him. And he leaves his followers to continue his work, empowered by his spirit. Very soon, however, people become impatient. And that's where Peter's letters are coming in. In, in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 4, just a little bit before that passage I read earlier, it says, for all of you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, He promised to come, didn't He? Where is He? Our fathers have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. And so, People become, become impatient, wondering if nothing's changed, everything still remains the same. When will this promise come true? And it's in that context that Peter's words are spoken, those words we heard earlier. Christ will return. The old will be completely destroyed and the new creation will be complete. The new creation where righteousness will be at home. Now, righteousness does not only mean doing the right thing, doing what God requires. The word that's used for righteousness in those scriptures speaks of right relationship with God. But it also speaks of justice, equity. Level paths. You see, with, with Isaiah's prophecy and then what John refers to, it's all about leveling the playing fields. It's about justice and equity. You see, it's, it's often said that there can be no peace without justice. The two go hand in hand. And peace is not just about the absence of of conflict. Peace is about God's life, shalom, for all people. All people experiencing the life that God intends for us. That's the righteousness that we need to experience here on earth as it is in heaven. Remember the call was to prepare the way of the Lord by making level paths. 
and clearing away all that gets in the way of a right relationship with God. But it's also what gets in the way of our relationship with one another. And that's why it's about justice. There's a beautiful passage in, in Psalm 85 that says, Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace to His people, to His faithful, to those who turn to Him in their hearts. Surely His salvation is at hand for those who fear Him, that His glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before Him, and will make His paths, and make a path for His steps. When God's saving presence is with us, Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. The season of Advent reminds us of what it is that we are to do as we live out God's presence with us now, and as we live in anticipation of the new creation that God will bring about one day. Where that the new creation where we will experience God's presence in all its fullness. In Revelation 21, the revelation given to John, we catch a glimpse of how it all ends. And in Revelation 21, verses 3 to 4, we hear the following. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with all humankind. He will live with them, and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them, and He will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. We know how the story ends. We know what God's intention is. And Peter's words remind us that we must not become complacent. There's work to do as we wait for God's perfect reign to come in all its fullness. We are to build for God's perfect reign here on earth as it is in heaven. To live out righteousness or justice, holy and dedicated to God, just as Peter said in that letter. And we need to note that holiness means set apart, but it means set apart in the sense of being different, not living in a way that perpetuates the mess of a world out of sync with God. It means living lives dedicated to righteousness, right relationship, justice, peace. Not like the Pharisees who separated themselves from everybody and, and separated people from one another, but like Jesus who, who connected with everybody and connected people together. Jesus who was referred to as a friend of sinners. That's what it means to be holy, not to separate ourselves, but to, to commit ourselves to living a way that perpetuates God's love and, and God's peace and justice for all, demonstrating God's life and love with us here and now, catching glimpses of what one day we will see in all its fullness. I want to close with an Advent litany that I came across this week. We wait for the coming of hope. We wait for the coming of love. We wait for the coming of justice. 
We wait for the coming of peace. We wait. How long, O oh Lord, shall we wait? What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? Have mercy on us, Christ Jesus. Forgive us our lack of hope, our lack of love, our lack of joy, our lack of peace. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you call us in readiness for the coming of Jesus. To look to ourselves that we might be properly prepared for Christ in our lives. But we recognize that we cannot and should not live in isolation from others. Separate from their needs and concerns, their hopes and anxieties. And so we pray for others. In the knowledge and the gratitude that right at this moment, other people will be praying for us. We pray for the church, for this congregation here, for all who minister to one another in the community of the faithful, in the compassion of our caring, and in the mission of the gospel, individually and together. May the peace of Christ bless us. May the love of Christ work through us, and may the light of Christ shine in the darkest places. We pray for our community, our country, and our world. Bless with compassion and tenderness those we know who work tirelessly for the good of others. Bless with wisdom and character those who have responsibilities in government. Bless with purpose those who are leaders, teachers, and role models for us all. Bless with your strength those who walk the corridors of power and who make decisions for the good of all humanity. We pray for those in need, close to us, those who struggle for direction, those who are no longer able to stand tall with purpose and commitment, those who are weak and frail, those who are ground down by worries and troubles, and in the silence we name them before you. We name them, those you already know, and we leave unnamed those who you also know. For we recognize that everyone is an individual under your loving gaze. And we pray for ourselves as we prepare in thoughtfulness for the coming of Jesus, that we might be honest with ourselves and open to your grace, and all to the greatest good. We give you thanks for the communion of saints, those who prepared our way, who've offered their guidance and wisdom and example, that we might boldly walk the path of righteousness and peace. Bind us ever with them, that we might journey on as one people under God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.